Hello, everyone. <laughs> we are back. Welcome to 2024. And this time, because I am lazier, there's no editing. I can't see it, but he's waving his arms around. Yeah. So we're going to be a bit crazier this time. We're yep. going to be a bit more insane. But we are still fully intending on reading the stuff that you come here to hear. <laughs> it's yes. A, it's basically the uh, Star Wars EU. So... The Jedi Academy Trilogy is what we're doing by Kevin J. Anderson, starting with his first book, Jedi Search. Yes, we'll start with chapter one. The black, hole <clears throat> the black hole cluster near Kessel reached out for the Millennium Falcon with jaws of gravity, drawing it close. Even in the model blur of hyperspace, Han Solo could see the huge distortion as a bruised whirlpool <clears throat> trying to suck them down to infinity. Hey, Chewie, don't you think that's too close? He stared at the Falcon's Navi computer, wishing they had chosen a course that would take them a safer distance from the Maw. What do you think this is, an old smuggling ma- Oh, gosh, dang it. <laughs> <laughs> what did I tell you? What do you think this is, an old smuggling mission? We got nothing to hide this time. Beside him, Chewbacca looked disappointed and grunted an excuse, waving his hairy, waving his hairy paws in the stifling air of the cockpit. Yeah, well... We're on an official mission this time. No more skulking about. Try to act dignified, okay? Chewbacca groaned a skeptical reply, then turned to his navigational screens. Han felt a pang at returning to his old haunts, reminded of when he had been just on the other side of the law, running spice, being chased by Imperial scout ships, when his life had been free and easy. On one of those frantic missions, he and Chewbacca had practically shaved the bottom plating off the Falcon, taking a shortcut and skimming closer to the mall cluster of black holes than had ever been that had ever before been recorded. Sensible pilots avoided the area, using longer paths that kept them clear of the black holes, but the Falcon's speed had carried them to safety on the other side, making the Kessel Run in under 12 parsecs. But that guaranteed sure thing mission had ended in a, but that guaranteed sure thing mission had ended in a disaster anyway. Han had dumped his load of spice just before being boarded by Imperials. This time, though, Khan was returning to Kessel under different circumstances. His wife, Leia, had appointed him an official representative of the New Republic, an ambassador of sorts, though the title seemed somewhat honorary. But even an honorary title had its advantages. Han and Chewbacca no longer had to, do no longer had to dodge scout ships or duck under planetary sensor nets or use the secret compartments on the de under the deck plates. Han Solo found himself in the unlikely and uncomfortable position of being respectable. There was no other word for it. But Han's new responsibilities weren't just quaint annoyances. He was married to Leia, who could have imagined that, and he had three children. Oh yeah, this takes place after Dark Empire. Oh, okay. just Just so that we're clear on the timeline. Gotcha. So Anakin Solo's already been born. Right. Han leaned back in his flight chair and locked his hands behind his head. He allowed a wistful smile to cross his face. He had visited the kids as often as he could in their protective isolation on a secret planet, and the twins were due to come home to Coruscant in a week. Anakin, the third little baby, had filled him with wonder as he tickled the tiny ribs, watching an expression of amusement cross the infant's face. Han Solo, a father figure? Leia had said a long time ago that she liked nice men, and that was exactly what Han was turning into. He caught Chewbacca looking at him out of the corner of his eye. Embarrassed, Han sat up straight and frowned out at the controls. Where are we? Shouldn't it be about time to end this jump? Chewbacca growled and... <clears throat> Chewie brought an affirmative, then reached out with a furry paw to grasp the hyperspace controls. The Wookiee watched the numbers tick away on his control panel. At the appropriate moment, he hauled backward on the lever that dropped them back into normal space. The mottled coloring of hyperspace fanned into star lines with a roar that Han felt more than he heard. Then they were surrounded by the expected tapestry of stars. Behind them, the spectacle of the Maw looked like a garish finger painting as ionized gases plunged into multiple black holes. Directly in front of the Falcon, Han saw the blue-white glare of Kessel's sun. As the ship rotated to align them with the elliptic, Kessel itself came into view, potato-shaped and, and manned with the tendrils of escaping atmosphere, orbited by a large moon that had once housed a garrison of Imperial troopers. Right on target, Chewie. Han said. Now let me have the controls. Kessel looked like a wraith coasting along its orbit, too small to hold on to its own atmosphere. Huge generating factories constantly process the raw rocks to release oxygen and carbon dioxide, making it possible for people to survive outside with simple breath masks instead of total environmental suits. A good portion of the newly manufactured atmosphere escaped into space, wisping behind the small planet like the tail of a giant comet. Chewbacca's barked a short, nasal comment. Han nodded. 
Yeah, looks great from up here. Too bad it's so different when you get a closer look. I never liked the place. Kessel was a major planet for spice reduction and seat of heavy smuggling activities, as well as a site for one of the toughest prisons in the galaxy. The Empire had controlled spice production except for what smugglers managed to steal from under Imperial noses. But with the fall of the Emperor, the smugglers and the prisoners in the Imperial Correctional faci Facility took over the planet. Kessel had laid low during the depredations of Grand Admiral Thrawn and the recent resurrection of the Emperor, keeping quiet and trying hard not to be noticed, answering no one's requests for help. A low growl rumbled in Chewie's throat. Han sighed and shook his head. Look, I'm not happy about going back there either, buddy, but things are different now. And we're the best people to do it. With the Civil War ended and the New Republic once again firmly seated on Coruscant, leaving scattered groups of Imperial warships to fight each other, it was time to reopen negotiations. Better to get them on our side than to let them sell out wherever they can, Han thought, which is what they probably do anyway. As, a represent as representative of the new unified smugglers, Luke's old nemesis Mara Jade had tried to contact Kessel and, been flat flat and had been flatly rebuffed. The Millennium Falcon approached Kessel, firing aft thrusters to help them catch up with the plant's motion, preparing for insertion into orbit. On the helm scanner screens, Han checked their approach. Factoring in. He said. Chewie made a quick comment and pointed at the screens. Han looked down to see blips already in orbit around the planet, emerging from the blanketing clouds of atmosphere. I see them. Looks like about a half dozen ships. Too far away to determine the types. H Han brushed aside Chewie's uneasy growl. Well, then we'll just tell them who we are. Don't worry. Why do you think Leia made such a fuss about getting us proper diplomatic ID signals and everything? He switched on the New Republic beacon that automatically pinged out their identification in BASIC and several other languages. To his surprise, the orbiting ships changed their vector in unison and increased speed to intercept the Falcon. Hey! Han shouted, then realized he had not switched on the audio pickup. Chewie roared. Han toggled the switch on. This is Han Solo, the New Republic ship Millennium Falcon. We are on a diplomatic mission. His mind raced, wondering what words a real diplomat would use. Uh, please state your intentions. The two closest ships raced in, first growing into, disti first growing into, dis into distinct points of light, then taking on shapes. Chewie, I think you'd better get our forward deflector shields up. I've got a bad feeling about this. He reached for the communication switch as Chewbacca brought up the shields, but then he looked through the front viewport. The two incoming ships roared toward him at unbelievable speed, spreading out on either side. The sight of their squared-off solar panels and central pilot compartments turn turned Han's blood to ice water. TIE fighters. Chewie, get over here. I'm taking the laser cannon. Before the Wookiee could reply, Han hauled himself up the access tube into the gunwell. He grabbed onto the gunner's chair, trying to reorient himself in the new gravity field. The TIE fighters came for a two-pronged attack, spreading above and below the Falcon and firing their lasers. As the ship lurched from the impact, Han managed to throw himself into the gunner's chair, grabbing for the harness buckle and strapping himself in. One of the attacking ships swooped overhead, and the Falcon's sensor panels howled with the sound of twin ion engines, from which the TIE fighter took its name. The enemy vessel fired again, but the beam streaked harmlessly through space. Okay. Chewie, take a vas- oh. <laughs> Chewie, take evasive action. Don't just fly straight. The Wookiee shouted something from below and Han yelled back. I don't know. You're piloting. You figure it out. Obviously, Kessel had not rolled out the welcome map for them. Had some vestige of the Empire taken over the planet? If so, Han needed to get that information back to Coruscant. Other ships were approaching now and somehow Han didn't think they were coming to help. Up ahead, the two TIE fighters swooped up to the TIE arc, executing the complete 180 and roaring back for a second attack on the Falcon. But this time, Han had managed to strap himself in and power up the laser batteries. On a scope, the TIE fighter made a digitized target, growing larger. The enemy ship came closer and closer. Han tightened his grip around the firing levers, knowing the TIE pilot would be doing the same. He waited, feeling sweat build up on his neck. He realized he was holding his breath. One more second. One more second. The targeting cross showed dead center on the starboard wing of the fighter. The instant Han pressed the firing button, Chewbacca threw the Falcon into an evasive ro roll. The laser blast went right. The laser blasts went wide, spraying toward the distant stars. The TIE fighter shot also missed, streaking in the opposite direction, coming perilously close to striking the second TIE fighter. The second fighter managed to readjust his aim quickly enough that his two shots scored the Falcon's shields. Han heard the spark spraying from the control panels. Chewie belled a preliminary damage report. Aft shields gone, forward shields still holding well. That meant they had to take the TIE fighters head on. 
As the first fighter swung around for a third pass, Han swiveled his gun turret as far as it would go and stared at the targeting screen again. This time he would forget about finesse and perfect accuracy. He just wanted to blast the sucker. His lasers were fully charged and he could afford to waste a few shots, as long as this wasn't going to be a prolonged battle. As soon as the targeting cross touched the image of the fighter, Han squeezed his firing buttons at full power, strafing his deadly laser across the path of the incoming ship. The Imperial fighter swooped in but could not change its course quickly enough, plow plowing through the shower of laser bolts. The ship erupted into a flame flower of exploding fuel tanks and expanding atmosphere. Han and Chewbacca shouted their triumph in unison. Even euphoric, Han didn't sit around patting himself on the back. Um. Yes. Let's go after the other one, Chewie. The second TIE fighter swerved outward in a long trajectory, then headed back toward Kessel. Hurry, before those reinforcements can get here. He wondered if perhaps he and Chewie Bob... He wondered if perhaps he and Chewbacca shouldn't turn and flee immediately, but part of him refused to let anybody take pot shots at the Millennium Falcon and just walk away from it. Chewbacca increased speed, closing, closing the gap between the Falcon and the TIE fighter. Just give me one good shot, Chewie. One good shot. He was in an unmarked modified light fader. Why would the TIE fighters come out shooting at them in the first place? Was it the New Republic ID beacon? What was going on at, what was going on at Kessel? Leia sat around thinking about details like that, analyzing the possibilities and coming up with scenarios. With her tremendous load of diplomatic duties, she was becoming more and more of a thinker each day, trying to solve things by committee and negotiation. But a political solution wouldn't work if an Imperial TIE fighter came in shooting at you. Another ship soared up from behind as they chased the TIE fighter toward Kessel. Han shot off a few bursts from his laser, but they all missed. Then he turned his attention to the ship tailing them. The Falcon had no operational shields back there. Chewbacca called out again from below. Then Han got a second surprise for the day. I see it, I see it. An X-Wing fighter approached from the rear, slowly gaining on the Falcon as they neared Kessel. Han took another pot shot at the TIE fighter. Even from this distance, the X-Wing fighter seemed old and battered, as if it had been repaired many times. Chewie, contact the X-Wing and tell him we'd appreciate whatever help he can give us. Han pressed his back against the firing chair and focused his attention on his target. The fling TIE fighter soared, off, soared into the wispy tail of the atmosphere behind the planet. Han could see a bright pathway as the speed of the ship ionized the gas. Then the X-Wing fired on the Falcon from behind. The laser sort of direct hit, incinerating the protruding sensor dish mounted on the top of the ship. Han and Chewie shot at each other, scrambling to figure out what to do. Chewbacca took the Falcon into a tight dive closer to the atmosphere of Kessel. Turn us around! Turn us around! They had to get their unprotected aft section out of the X-Wing's line of fire. The X-Wing shot again, burning metal on the hull of the Falcon. All the lights went out inside the ship. From the lurch of the cabin, Han knew the hit had been a bad one. He could already smell something burning below decks. Emergency lights clicked on. We've got to get out of here! Chewbacca barked the Wookiee equivalent of, no kidding. They ducked into the atmospheric tail, buffeted by the sudden dense gas particles pelting the ship. Around them, streamers of heated, gla gas, streamers of heated gas glowed orange and blue. The X-Wings came in from behind, still firing. Han's, mind's ra Han's mind raced. They could skim around Kessel in a tight orbit, then slingshot back out of the system. With the black hole cluster so close at hand, no one would risk jumping into hyperspace without intensive prior calculations, and neither he nor Chewie could spare the time to do them. With the Falcon sensor dish slagged, Han couldn't even send out a distress call or try to sweet-talk the traitorous commander of the X-Wing. He couldn't even surrender. Talk about being stuck. Chewie, if you have- oh, sorry, that's you. Yeah. <laughs> Chewie, if you have any suggestions- He stops talking as his mouth dropped open. As they swept around Kessel, Han detected wave after wave of fighter ships launching from a gar the garrison moon, raising a defensive curtain the Millennium Falcon would never be able to cross. He saw hundreds of ships of every size and make imaginable, salvaged warships and stolen pleasure cruisers. Reaching the safety of numbers, the second TIE fighter did another tight loop to join the rest of the group. And they all came in shooting with the blur of turbo laser bolts that looked like a fireworks display. Despite the motley appearance of the Kessel fleet, Han's sensor showed that their weapons worked just fine. The attacking X-Wing scored a direct hit. The cabin shook. The Falcon took, took a turn upward as Chewbacca tried to flee the oncoming wave of ships. Han sent a barrage of laser fire into the cluster and was gratified to see the engine pod of a small Z-95 headhunter fighter burst into flames. The snub fighter dropped out of the attacking fleet and wobbled toward Kessel's atmosphere. Han hoped it would crash. Seeing that it would serve no purpose to keep firing against overwhelming odds, Han dropped back down the active shaft of the gun turret to the cockpit to see what he could do to assist Chewbacca. Then the fleet of ships began pummeling them. The X-Wing fired again, scoring a second direct hit. A firestorm of laser blasts struck their forward deflector shields. Chewie slewed the Falcon from side to side in a futile invasive maneuver. 
Hans huddled himself into the other pilot's chair just in time to see the indicator lights for the forward shields wink out. They were now unprotected from the front and from behind. Another hit rocked them, and Hans' chest smacked against the control panel. There goes the main drive unit. We're space meet in the next barrage. Take us down, Chewie. Get us into the atmosphere. It's the only thing we can do. Chewbacca started to express his disbelief, but Han grabbed the controls and sent them lurching down toward Kessel. It's gonna be a bumpy ride. Hold on to your fur. The storm of attacking ships rolled in space as the Falcon plowed into the white atmosphere of Kessel. Han grabbed a seat as the ship struck the clouds. He suddenly felt the buffeting winds caused by gouts of air escaping into space. From his control panels and the stench leaking from the back compartments, Han knew that his maneuvering capabilities would be minimal. By the groaning sounds from his co-pilot, he knew the Wookiee had realized the same thing. Think of it this way, Chewie. If we land this thing in one piece, our skill as pilots will be legendary from one end of the galaxy to the other. Han said with a humor he did not feel. I knew I shouldn't have come back to Kessel. The Falcon was going down. Both, Chew both Han and Chewbacca fought to keep a steady downward course that would not burn them up in an unsubstantial atmosphere. Kessel's main defense fleet swept into orbit and prepared for an orderly descent. One sleek insectile ship, which Han recognized as a black market-built Hornet Inceptor, peeled off, streaking downward at the Falcon's backdraft. Chewbacca saw it first. The ship, aerodynamically perfect, slid through the atmosphere like a vibroblade, ignoring the heat generated on its hull. The ship fired surgical strikes of turbo lasers at the Falcon's maneuvering jets, disabling them further. We're already crashing! Han bellowed. What more do you want? What more do they want? Oh, dang it. <laughs> uh, yeah. See, these are the kinds of mistakes you don't hear. Yes. What more do they want? But he knew. They wanted the Falcon to be destroyed on impact. All occupants erased. Han suspected he didn't need any help from the Hornet Inceptor. As they plunged downward, the Falcon approached one of the giant atmosphere factories, a huge smokestack mounted on the surface of Kessel, where immense engines catalyzed the rock and, cook and cooked out gases into a cyclone of breathable air. The Hornet Inceptor fired again. The Falcon lurched from the near miss. Chewbacca's face was grim. His fangs showed as he concentrated on keeping them alive. Chewie, pull us a Chewie, pull as close to the plume as you can. I've got an idea. Chewbacca yelled, but Han cut him off. Just do it, buddy. When the Hornet tried to outflank them, Han swept the ship aside Han swept the ship aside as the towering plume of atmosphere rolled into the sky. The Hornet Inceptor tried to second guess his move, but Han lurched sideways again, driving the Hornet into the roaring up upward flow of wind. An aileron strut in the delicate insectile wing snapped off, and the Hornet spun into the cyclone. Other parts of its hull broke apart as the ship tried to escape, but lurched deeper into the danger zone. Han gave a cry of triumph as the ship exploded into flames that were pulled to tatters by the atmospheric, atmosphere factory's vortex. Then the surface of Kessel rushed up at them like a gigantic hammer. Han fought with the, con Han fought with the controls. At least we'll have a soft landing with the new repulsor lifts we installed, he said. He grabbed at the panel, priming the controls. Chewbacca barked at him to hurry. Han activated the repulsor lifts as he simultaneously heaved a sigh of relief. Nothing. What? He slammed his fingers on the switch again and again, but the repulsor lifts refused to operate. I just had those fixed! Han yelled above the noise of the screaming wind as he fought to bring the Falcon under some semblance of control. Okay, Chewie, I'm definitely open for suggestions. But Chewbacca had no time to answer before the ship crashed into the rugged surface of Kessel. No, we're doing two chapters. We are? Yes, it'd be faster. It'll go. We'll be able to do things faster. It's fine. You'll like this chapter. What? Now I'm just getting bombarded with ads. It's poisoning my phone. It's really fine. All right. Chapter 2. The towers of Imperial City rose to the sky, high above the shadowed surface of the planet Coruscant. The cornerstones of the towers have been, pla have been in place for more than a thousand generations, dating back to the formative days of the Old Republic. Over the millennia, higher and higher structures have been built on top of the ruined foundations. Luke Skywalker stepped onto a shuttle landing platform that jutted out from the scarred, monolithic face of the former Imperial Palace. Gusts of wind whipped around him, and he pulled back the hood of his Jedi robe. Of his Jedi robe. He looked into the sky, pondering the thin layer of atmosphere that protected Coruscant from space beyond. Wrecked ships still rode in haphazard orbits, debris from the vicious battles when the Alliance had recently recaptured the planet from Imperial control during the Civil War and the remnants of the Empire. 
Higher than the tops of the towers, kite-like hawk bats rode thermal currents rising the, from the canyons of the city. As he watched, one hawk bat swooped down, down into the dark crevices beneath ancient buildings, finally emerging a moment later with something cylindrical and dripping, a granite slug, perhaps, in its claws. Luke bided his time, using a Jedi med meditation technique to quell the anxiety inside him. As a younger man, he had been fidgety. As a younger man, he had been fidgety and impatient, filled with uncertainty. Yoda had taught him patience, along with so many other things. A true Jedi Knight could wait as long as necessary. The New Republic Senate had been in session for only an hour, and they would still be working on mundane issues. Luke wanted to startle them after they had been talking for a while. The immense metropolis of Imperial City bustled around him, little change now that it was a little change now that it was the seat of the New Republic instead of the Empire. Prior to that it had been the capital of the Old Republic. The Capitol building, formerly Emp Emperor Palpatine's palace, was made of polished gray-green rock and mirrored crystals, sparkling in the hazy sunlight of Coruscant, as it towered over all other structures, even the adjoining Senate building. Much of Imperial City had been laid to waste during the months of the Civil War following the downfall of Grand Admiral Thrawn. The various factions of the old Empire had fought over the em Emperor's homeworld, turning vast districts into graveyards of crashed ships and exploded buildings. Does it say the Emperor's homeworld? Does it assume here that the Emperor's homeworld is actually Coruscant? I think they're just saying, like, it was the capital. It was where he lived when he was emperor. The canon is that Palpatine came from Naboo. <laughs> Do they know that? <laughs> not, not at the time of this writing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's okay. Huh. And I get, and I'm, I get, I'm just saying, like, and again, I'm just saying, like, it's the home. It was the home world of the emperor, not Palpatine. Um. Okay. Yeah. You. You can live with that. <laughs> I am try. I'm. I'm like. I'm giving them. Ex I'm like excusing it. You're just being critical. Uh huh. But the tide of battle had turned, and the New Republic had driven back the vestige of the Empire. The vestiges of the Empire. Many Alliance soldiers now turned their efforts to repairing the damage. His friend. His friend Wedge Antilles among them. Top priority had been given to rebuilding the former Imperial Palace in the Senate Chambers. The Emperor's own construction droids ranged through the ranged through the battle-scarred wastelands, automatically scraping up raw materials from the wreckage for conversion into new buildings. In the distance, Luke could see one of the enormous droids, 40 stories tall, wrecking a half-collapsed building shell and plowing a path where its programming had deemed a new elevated transport path should be routed. Its girder arms toppled the stone face of the building, pulling free, metal, pulling free metal support structures and feeding the debris into a processing mouth where the materials would be separated and new components extruded. extruded. During the previous year of the viol of violent strife, Luke had been whisked away to the resurrected Emperor's stronghold in the Galactic Core, and there he had allowed himself to learn the dark side. He had become the Emperor's chief lieutenant, just like his father, Darth Vader. The struggle had been a gr had been great within him, and only with the help and the friendship and the love of Han and Leia had he been able to break free. There, that w that is the Dark Empire in a nutshell. <laughs> that is what happened. So, okay, this story is set after the rise of Skywalker. <laughs> I broke her. <laughs> if you want to say that, sure. <laughs> yeah, they're both Emperor Resurrection stories. Yeah, but I was just talking about that paragraph. Yeah, I know. The, the, the original Dark Empire story. Yeah, I story. know. Yes. Yeah. Luke saw a diplomatic shuttle dropping down from orbit with its locator lights rippling in a complex sequence. Its jets turned off with a whining sound as it coasted toward a landing pad on the far side of the palace. Luke Skywalker had been through the fire now. Inside, his heart seemed a diamond hard lump. He wasn't merely another Jedi Knight. He was the only remaining Jedi Master. He had survived tests and rigors more potent than routine Jedi training prepared him for. Luke understood more than about Luke understood more about the Force now than he had ever dreamed possible. Sometimes it terrified him. So yeah, he viewed the Dark em he viewed the events of Dark Empire as his test to become a master. Gotcha. Okay. He thought of the days when he had been idealistic and adventuresome, riding the Millennium Falcon and dueling blindly with a practice remote as Ben Kenobi watched. Luke remembered also the skepticism he had felt as he swooped down upon the first Death Star during the Battle of Yavin, trying to locate a tiny thermal exhaust port. Ben's voice had spoken to him then, telling him to trust in the Force. Luke understood much more now, especially why the old man's eyes had held such a haunted look. Another hawk bat swooped down into the dark maze of the lower levels of the buildings, flapping its wings as it climbed back up, holding a squirming prize in its claws. As Luke watched, a second hawk bat dove in on an intercept course, grabbing the prey out of the first gra first's grasp. Far away, he could hear their cawing sounds as they slashed and toward each other. The squirming prey, no longer heated, fell through the air, buffeted by rising currents until it struck ground somewhere in the alley dimness. 
The two hawk bats locked in mortal combat also fell as they struggled with each other, until they too smashed into an outcropping of the abandoned lower levels. A troubled expression crossed Luke's face. An omen? He was supposed to address the New Republic Senate. The time had come. He turned and walked back inside the cool corridors, pulling his robe tightly around himself. Luke stood at the entrance to the Senate assembly chamber. The room swept down to a giant amphitheater in which sat the inner circle of appointed senators and outer rows of representatives from different planets, different alien races. Real-time hollows of the proceedings would be broadcast around Imperial City and recorded for transmission to other planets. Sunlight filtered through the fragmented crystal segments in the ceiling high overhead, fanning out the spectrum in a rainbow effect over the most important people at the center of the room, scintillating around them as they moved, designed, Luke knew, by the Emperor himself to strike awe to those observing him. As she spoke now on the central dais, Mon Lothma, the, the New Republic's chief of state, seemed uncomfortable in the grandeur of the assembly chamber. Luke allowed a smile to cross his face as he remembered the first time he had seen Mon Lothma, describing the plans of their second Death Star as the rebels approached Endor. With her short reddish hair and soft voice, Mon Mothma did not look like a tough-as-nails military commander. As a former member of the Imperial Senate, Mon Mothma seemed to be more in her element now, trying to forge the pieces of the New Republic into a strong, unified government. Beside Mon Mothma sat Luke's sister, Leia Organa Solo, straight-backed, and listening to every moment of the proceedings. Leia had been performing more and more diploma important diplomatic activities with each passing month. Around the dais sat members of the Alliance High Command, important figures in the rebellion given roles in the new government. General Don, General Jan, General, General Jan, I'm trying to, General Jan Dodonna, is that mm, how you, okay, sure, yeah. who had led the Battle of Yavin against the first Death Star, General Carlos Rieken, former commander of Echo Base on the ice planet Th Hoth, General Crix Met Medin, an Imperial defector who had been invaluable in planning this destruction of the second Death Star, Admiral Akbar, who had led the rebel fleet in the Battle of Endor, Senator Garmbel Iblis, who had brought his dreadnought ships against Grand Admiral Thrawn. Battlefield credentials did not necessarily imply that these brave leaders would be gifted politicians as well, but since the hold of the New Republic was still shaky, as the recent devastating civil war had shown, it made good sense to keep military commanders in positions of power. Ra finishing her speech, Mama Mothma raised her hands. For a moment it looked as if she were about to give a benediction. I call for any new business. Does anyone wish to speak? Wait, hang on. Should I do British for that? Yeah, it's pretty close. I call for any new business. Does anyone wish to speak? Luke's timing had been perfect. He stepped into the light at the entrance archway and drew back his hood. He spoke softly, but used his Jedi powers to project with sufficient strength that everyone in the entire amphitheater heard him. I would address the assembly, Mon Mothma, if I may. He walked down the steps with a gliding stride, quickly enough that the others would not lose patience, but with enough grace to imply his own strength of character. Appearance, appearances could deceive, Yoda had said, but sometimes appearances are, could be very important. As he descended the long ramp, Luke felt all eyes turn toward him. A hush fell over the assembly. Luke Skywalker, the lone remaining Jedi Master, almost never took part in governmental proceedings. I have an important matter to address, he said. For a moment, he was reminded of when he had walked alone in the dank corridors of Jabba the Hutt's palace, but this time there were no pig-like Gamorrean guards that he could manipulate with the twist of his fingers and a touch of the Force. Mon Mothma gave him a soft, mysterious smile and gestured for him to take a central position. The words of a Jedi Knight are always welcome to the New Republic, she said. Luke tried not to look pleased. She provided the perfect opening for him. In the Old Republic, he said, Jedi Knights were the protectors and guardians of us all. For a thousand generations, the Jedi used the powers of the Force to guide, defend, and provide support for the rightful government of worlds. Before the dark days of the Empire came and the Jedi Knights were killed. He let his words hang, then took another breath. Now we have a new republic. The Empire appears to be defeated. We have founded a new government based upon the old. But let us hope we learn from our mistakes. Before, an entire order of Jedi watched over the republic, offering strength. Now I am the only Jedi Master who remains. Without that order of protectors to provide a backbone of strength for the new republic... Can we survive? Will we be able to weather the storms and the difficulties of forging a new union? Until now, we have suffered severe struggles, but in the future, they will be seen as nothing more than birth pangs. Before the other, before the other senators could disagree with that, Luke continued. Our people had a common foe in the Empire, and we must not let our defenses lap, 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 
blah, blah. <laughs> now go. he's lapsing. <laughs> this is what's happening. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta slap a bit. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> and we must not let our defenses lapse just because we have internal problems. More to the point, what will happen when we be, when we be, more to the point, what will happen when we begin squabbling among ourselves over petty matters? The old Jedi helped to mediate many types of disputes. What if there are no Jedi Knights to protect us in the difficult times ahead? Luke moved under the distracting rainbow colors from the crystal light overhead. He took his, he took his time to fix his gaze on all the senators present. He turned his attention to Leia last. Her eyes were wide but supportive. He had not discussed his idea with her beforehand. My sister is undergoing Jedi training. She has a great deal of skill in the Force. Her three children are also likely candidates to be trained as young Jedi. In recent years, I have come to know a woman named Mara Jade, who is now unifying the smugglers, the former smugglers. He amended into an organization that can support the needs of the New Republic. She also has a talent for the Force. I have encountered others in my travel. Another pause. The audience was listening so far. But are these the only ones? We already know the ability to use the Force is passed from generation to generation. Most of the Jedi were killed in the Emperor's Purge, but, but could he possibly have eradicated all of the descendants of those knights? I myself was unaware of the potential power within me until Obi-Wan Kenobi taught me how to use it. My sister Leia was similarly unaware. How many people are abroad in this galaxy who have a comparable strength in the Force, who are potential members of a new order of Jedi Knights, but are unaware of who they are? Luke looked at, Luke looked at them again. In my brief search, I have already discovered that there are indeed some descendants of former Jedi. I have come here to ask. He turned, a, he turned a gesture toward Mon Mothma, swept his hand across the people gathered there in the chamber. For two things. First, that the New Republic officially sanctioned my search for those with a hidden talent for the Force, to seek them out and try to bring them to our service. For this, I will need some help. Admiral Akbar interrupted, blinking his huge fish eyes and turning his head. But if you yourself did not know your power when you were young, how will these other people know? How will you find them, Luke? How will you find them, Jedi Skywalker? Luke folded his hands in front of him. Several ways. First, with the help of two dedicated droids who will spend their days searching through the Imperial si searching through the Imperial City databases, we may find likely candidates, people who have experienced miraculous strokes of luck whose lives seem filled with incredible coincidences. We could look for people who seem unusually charismatic, or those whom legend credits working with... working. Oh my god, that was a really awkward <laughs> sentence. Who seem unusually charismatic, or those whom legend credits with working miracles. These could all be unconscious manifestations of a skill with the Force. Luke held up another finger. As well, the droids could search the database for forgotten descendants of known Jedi Knights from the Old Republic days. We should turn up a few leads. And what will you yourself be doing? Mon Mothma asked, shifting in her robes. I've already found several candidates I wish to investigate. All I ask right now is that you agree this is something we should pursue, that the search for Jedi be conducted by others, and not just myself. Mon Mothma sat up straighter in her central seat. I think we can agree to that without further discussion. She looked around to the other senators, seeing them nod agreement. Tell us your second request. Luke stood taller. This was most important to him. He saw Leia stiffen. If sufficient candidates are found who have potential for using the Force, I wish to be allowed, with the New Republic's blessing, to establish in some appropriate place an intensive training center, a Jedi Academy, if you will, under my deck... Under my direction, we can help these students discover their abilities to focus and strengthen their power. Ultimately, this academy would provide a core group that could allow us to restore the Jedi Knights as protectors of the New Republic. He drew in a deep breath and waited. Senator Bell Iblis raised himself slowly to his feet. A comment, if I may. I'm sorry, Luke, but I have to raise the question. We've already seen the terrible damage a Jedi can cause if he allows himself to be swayed by the dark side. 
We just recently fought against Joris so- Sabioth. That character that sounds like this! <laughs> Good thing you never have to do that ever again. I know. <laughs> He's re- restricted to that one trilogy. Unless we do him in Outbound Flight. Um, we have to do Outbound Flight. <laughs> we just recently fought against Joros Sabaoth, and of course Darth Vader nearly caused the death of us all. If a teacher as great as Obi-Wan Kenobi could fail, and let a student fall to evil, how can we take the risk of training an, an entire new order of Jedi Knights? How many will turn to the dark side? How many new enemies will we make for ourselves? Luke nodded somberly. The question had been working at the back of his own mind, and he had pondered it deeply. I can only say that we have seen these terrible examples, and we must learn from them. I myself have touched the dark side, and come through stronger and more wary of its powers than ever before. I agree there is a risk, but I cannot believe the New Republic will be safer without a new force of Jedi. Murmur rippled through the chamber. Bel Iblis stood a moment longer, as if he meant to say something else. But instead he sat down, looking satisfied. Admiral Akbar got to his feet and applauded with his fl- flipper-like hands. I agree that the Jedi's request is in the best interests of the New Republic, he said. Jan Dodonna also stood. After narrowly surviving the Battle of Yavin, Dodonna had, trust- Dodonna had treated Luke with complete trust. I agree as well. Soon all the senators were standing. Luke saw a broad grin on Leia's face as she, stood- as she too stood. He felt the rainbows around him from the crystal ceiling, seemingly full of power, and he felt warm inside. Mon Mothma sat, nodding gravely. She was the last to stand up, and she raised her hands for silence. I give you my hopes for the rebirth of the Jedi Knights. We will offer whatever help we can. May the Force be with you. Before Luke could turn, applause from the audience rolled like a storm through the chamber. Whoa, okay, so that was the first two chapters of Jedi Academy. What do you Um, think so far? It's fine. Yeah. Um, so, cool. This is uh, what it sounds like when it's not edited. Yes. It's going to feel weird at first. I think you guys will get used to it. And honestly, that was not a terrible reading. No. So, um, yeah. Well, the funny thing is, there were so few mistakes, there would have been so few for me to edit out. But unfortunately, You've already... I am a busy man. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, we can end it a little more properly by saying goodbye to everyone. And yeah. we'll see you next week for chapters three and four. Yep. Bye. Bye.